Les humains à leur meilleur. C'est toi pour Héro. Hello again, my friends. Hope you continue to stay healthy and sane in these tumultuous times. I did another live stream with a health professional and just uploaded to YouTube. This time it was an ICU nurse working in the COVID unit in a hospital in downtown LA area. This goes along with my posts on social media where I made an inquiry for anecdotes of super healthy individuals getting severe cases and ending up in the hospital. I had a lot of interesting comments from that post, including some people accusing me of one thing or another. I don't know where they're getting any malicious ideas from. I actually really want to know if there are people in our health community experiencing severe cases. So far, I've heard of none. People mentioned two Spanish soccer players who seemed healthy, and there were two reports of people in their 40s where the commenter assumed they were healthy. I still haven't heard of anyone who actively focuses on their health and actually engages in healthy lifestyle behaviors on a daily basis, dying or going to the ICU. I only hear about people eating a standard American diet who aren't yet diagnosed with an actual disease. I want to prove myself wrong here. I don't want to be lulled into a false sense of security. But so far, it seems that the supposedly, quote, healthy people ending up in the ICU are 40 plus obese males. My nurse friend Riley confirmed this in our live stream in her limited sample set. And everything that people sent me seemed to confirm this as well. There were reports of thin people getting it, I'll admit. But this spurs the question, are thin people always healthy? No way. Many commenters have expounded on this, telling stories of how messed up they were health-wise even when outwardly they looked in shape. So I'm not saying just because you're overweight you're unhealthy, or just because you're thin you're healthy. I'm also not saying you're going to avoid a severe COVID case just because you are healthy. There was one anecdote of a healthy person on a low-carb diet who qualified for a major triathlon. I don't know much more about his diet or health status other than someone reporting this, but I won't sweep it under the rug. There's always outliers here. We don't know everything about this virus, obviously, and I'm by no means the expert. I'm just trying to get people to focus on the thing they definitely have control of in these crazy times, their own health. Focus down on keeping yourself metabolically healthy. Do home workouts and keep your nutrient density super high with every meal. Get some fresh air and some sun. Stay positive and have some control in your life by doing these things. Enough out of me. Let's get to the episode. Dr. Chris Kenobi is an esteemed eye physician and surgeon in Boulder, Colorado and currently leads a Cure AMD Foundation. Cure AMD Foundation seeks to spread the message regarding his research that AMD, age-related macular degeneration, is caused by westernization of the diet. Luckily, he has a theory that macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss and blindness, is not only preventable but also treatable with the implementation of an ancestral diet. He came to this conclusion when he left his full-time practice to commit his time to numerous years of full-time investigative research on nutrition. He now shares his breakthrough findings on this and the harms of industrial seed oils through presentations across the country as well as scientific papers and books. You can learn more at cureamd.org. He did an amazing presentation in Denver recently and has really brought a lot of new information to the table when it comes to the industrial seed oils being the root of all evil. I'm not even exaggerating that much. Populations can be healthy on almost any diet on the planet until the high omega-6 seed oils come into the picture. These go along with processed foods, of course, and the refined grains and sugar. But maybe the seed oils are the real X factor. Long-time listeners will be familiar with this concept from episode 20 with Tucker Goodrich, who did an eye-opening interview on this same topic. Go back and check this one out and make sure to start episode 1 to get the full download of all this super valuable health info. So make sure to balance your omega 3s to omega 6s and definitely don't eat oxidized vegetable oils which are even worse. The ones they use in deep fryers that are reused and kept at super high temperatures. You can get super high omega 3 to omega 6 ratio pork and chicken at nosetotail.org. We have a bit left and we'll be restocking Friday. Pork and chicken have gotten a bad rap in our health community, and rightly so, because they are usually super high in omega-6 compared to omega-3. At Nose to Tail, we feed our animals a special and expensive diet that's super high in omega-3, which makes the meat have an unmatched omega-3 content. Our beef also has a great ratio, as does all beef that's solely grass-fed and finished. Get all the organ meats mixed in as well with our primal ground beef. Get it while it lasts at nosetotail.org. Thanks also for the continued support on Patreon. You can be one of the proud supporters or show producers, you could say. The ones that make this show possible. That's patreon.com slash peakhuman. Also, please continue to share and rate this show on iTunes or the podcast app. 
Five-star reviews help get the show noticed and let the big important guests I'm trying to get on the show know that it's worth their time. Really appreciate each and every one of you. Much love and enjoy today's interview. All right, let's get this going. Dr. Chris Kenobi, you're an ophthalmologist and associate clinical professor emeritus. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, Brian? I'm awesome. Just being at home. We're in the crazy times. If anyone's you know listening to this in the future, this is during the lockdown period of the coronavirus. Yeah, it's kind of uh, ghostly most places. Yeah. All we can do is carry on and try to focus on our health and keep this podcast going and keep this great information coming from all the great people like yourself. Uh, thank you. Uh, hopefully I can add to the knowledge base here. Well, let's do it. So we spent some time together in Denver and I watched your presentation. It was so great. It's on omega-6, you know, these oils and seed oils taking over our world. And uh, I had Tucker Goodrich on a long time ago. And so I thought it was a great time to have someone else on and cover this from a different angle. And you also, you know, work with AMD in curing AMD, which is an eye disease that people think is just degenerative, right? It just happens. But you are right. saying that's not true. Right. That's a, another huge part of my research is in the area of age-related macular degeneration. Right. We can do that at the end. So okay. I'd love to hit that. I think it's super interesting because I even know someone back home who seems to be this type of problem and she's pretty young. So I'm interested in this, but let's start with the seed oils because the more people I talk to in this space, the more people kind of zone in on this could be the major problem. It's not maybe the carbs, not maybe the sugar, not that those aren't bad. They're terrible. You know, these refined ways we eat them, but maybe it's just the omega sixes. Right, Brian. So this is kind of where my research has led me. Um, I sort of got involved in all of this about nine years ago, actually through, just so you know, through my own suffering, I had arthritis mm -hmm. that was really bad and just very quickly, I went on a kind of a partial paleo diet. I was dramatically better within 10 days. Hmm. Um, this kind of led me down the path of trying to, uh, it was such a life-changing event for me because I'd suffered with arthritis for 16 years at that point. And anyway, so it got me interested in nutrition. A couple of years later, I came across the research of Weston A. Price. And I'm sure your listeners probably know for those who don't, Weston Price was a uh, highly accomplished nutrition researcher that in the 1930s, he evaluated people on five different continents in hundreds of tribes and villages and thousands of people all around the world, like I said, in, on five continents, um, as they transitioned from their native traditional diets over to westernized diets uh, in his anthropological studies, discovered what was happening to them as they made that transition. And what it was is they rapidly developed dental decay. And then that was followed by all this degenerative disease, which usually began with arthritis and cancers. As you and I know, you know, since Price's day, which was Price died in 1948. But since then, there's literally just been thousands and thousands of studies that essentially have connected processed foods to diseases of civilization sort you know this is what i understood that big principle back in 2013 so then i sort of launched into the investigation of how processed foods drive age-related macular degeneration and so anyway i left practice to pursue that on a full-time basis in 2015 and went public with that research in 2016 and then kind of since, you know, a lot of my research in the last couple of years keeps coming back to the vegetable oils, the seed oils, which is what mm -hmm. you, you know, the question that you brought up. And, and the reason it has, Brian, is because it, the way I see it is that there are two massive drivers of obesity and chronic disease. And when I say chronic disease, I mean heart disease, hypertension, stroke cancers, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, the autoimmune diseases like lupus, rheumatoid. What I believe is, is the major culprit is seed oils. But what I was going to say is the big picture is that, and we really got to focus on the big picture, is that in, within our own physiology, I think there's two primary drivers, and it's nutrient deficiency and toxicity. 
Mm-hmm. And so where do those come from? And they come from processed food. So I want to make it really, really clear that man-made processed nutrient deficient and toxic foods, and I don't use the term toxic lightly here, I mean these are the equivalent of poisons. And what processed foods are, and Price discovered this way back in 1939, 1945, they're really just mostly four things. It's refined added sugar, uh, refined wheat flour, or uh, maybe other flours, the polyunsaturated vegetable oils, and trans fats. So just those four things. And if you put those four things together, those all have been essentially introduced into our diet since the mid-19th century. They were all collectively in our diet by 1911, those four things, and those have overtaken our food supply. And today, big food manufacturers make around 600,000 foods, the bulk of which are made out of those four things. Mm, And so those four things, they have essentially virtually no nutrients, and three of them at least are very toxic, and that's the PUFA seed oils, the high PUFA, meaning polyunsaturated fatty acid seed oils, trans fats, and at least the fructose part of sugar. So as of 2009, those four components of processed foods put together, our own USDA tells us they occupy 63% of the American diet. That right there is the cause of virtually all of this disease. And the consumption is still increasing. So that's the big picture. So now, do you want me to go on and tell you a little bit more about seed oils? For sure. we got to dive into all of this. Make sure people understand that that's two-thirds of our diet almost is made up of nutritionless, almost poison. And you could say toxicity, you know, it is poison. And it's this double whammy, right? You're you're talking about this nutrient deficiency plus the toxicity. It's this double whammy, double-edged sword. Then just to go back to Weston Price, I try to bring him up on every podcast. I was doing that for a while. (laughs) Love talking about Weston Price. And so longtime listeners should know about him. And if you're not a longtime listener, I think you should go back and start episode one of this podcast. But yeah, keep going on the vegetable oils. Yeah, absolutely, Brian. I agree 100%. I tell people always that if you only want to read one book on nutrition, read Weston Price's Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. There was two versions, one in 1939, one in 1945. The 1945 version has a little more information that he didn't have in the the 1939 version. But you read that, almost all you need to know. Now, he didn't understand at that point, he didn't have all the evidence about the toxicity of vegetable oils and trans fats and sugar. But if you follow his principles, you fix ver- almost or prevent or fix almost all of our chronic disease. Game so, changer book, a legendary book, life changing. No one should get married or have kids before reading that book too. It talks a lot about having healthy children and all that stuff. And I can't say enough about it. That is exactly how I feel, Brian. I think it is a it changed my life. I wouldn't be, you know, giving presentations. I wouldn't have a book and I wouldn't probably know much of anything about nutrition if it weren't for Weston Price because it's everything I do revolves around his fundamental principles. And by the way, I just want to say that what Price discovered, you know, in those native traditional populations that were consuming their native traditional diets was that they consume 10 times more fat-soluble vitamins, which is A, D, and K2, four times more water-soluble vitamins, which is all the B vitamins and C, and one and a half to 60 times more minerals in their diets than did the Americans of 1930s. And you think about it, the Americans of 1930s, their diet was way better than ours. Yeah, they're eating whole foods a lot. Yeah, they had a lot more whole food. And what we need to understand was that Price left the United States to evaluate these populations all over the world because of one reason. And it was, and the way he put it was, there are no suitable controls at home. And what Price meant by that was, you can't find suitable controls, meaning people consuming native traditional diets in the United States. They're just hard, hardly any. No way. And they had already, even by the 1920s and 30s, people were consuming enough of these processed foods in the form of diverse refined wheat, vegetable oils, and trans fats 
that he was already seeing severe tooth decay, cancer, heart disease, all that by the 1930s. So he left to go discover people who weren't consuming those and evaluated those populations against their genetic cohorts who were often in a nearby town or village or port or wherever where they could access processed foods. And I'm telling you, again, just for listeners who haven't read that, it is just so powerful and so moving and life-changing. So It's a long book. It's maybe a hard read for some people. But yeah, he goes over each country and each tribe he visited. You could maybe just read the beginning and the ending first. They have a lot of the summary and recap. And then maybe you could go back and read each account of each place he visited is what I did. But it's so amazing. Yeah. Like you said, the people who had access to these flowers and sugars and oils that came in from the ports and then they started, you know, the commerce happened, the, the trading started to happen. And that's when it started. Remarkable difference in their health. And one more thing I want to say about my thing is a sapien diet. You know, I've been talking about this more. <laughs> I'm unapologetically borrowing from the Weston Price. There's a foundation, you know, they've been doing this stuff for years, promoting the way of eating that he found. And it's all based on the traditional preparations of foods and whole foods and basically zero processed foods, but also the traditional preparations, which is really important. And Dr. Bill Schindler is really into this. You can listen to that podcast. That is so important is people have so many problems with these plant foods that people are going carnivore these days. Maybe you don't have to go carnivore if we prepared the plant foods properly because all these people knew that there were toxic elements in these plants. So they would soak and ferment and do all these different things to get the anti-nutrients out and make the nutrients more bioavailable. So basically the sapien diet is a low carb Western price diet. <laughs> I just think most people probably need to go low carb these days because they're probably already metabolically damaged or there's all these other things going on in our modern civilization. So maybe you can produce grains properly and soak it overnight and do the fermenting and sprouting and whatnot. But you know, I just wanted to put that in there because I haven't talked about how I even came up with this sapien diet. It's an animal-based, you know, low carb, basically traditionally prepared diet, nose to tail. Oh, okay, Brian. Yes, I did not know about that. Um, yeah. I mean, that was something that you were yeah. talking about and promoting, and that all makes really good sense to me. Let's talk about vegetable oils, if that's good, right? Yes, let's do it. Okay. So let me just say this, that you know, one of the things I like to point out is, is there's been a whole lot of uh, interest and in talk about Tanya Blasbog's research. She's at the NIH, and she has a group that published the evidence for soybean oil, which I'm very, very happy about and very pleased about. But what Tanya Blasberg made mention of is the fact that soybean oil between 1909 and 1999 increased a thousand fold in our diet. Yeah. And this, I read this over and over and over, and it's, you know, it's one of the most quoted you know, pieces of data regarding vegetable oils that I see. Let me tell you this. It's a lot worse than that because for 99, I don't know, 7% of all of the population of the world, nobody had ever seen polyunsaturated vegetable oils in any population, any significant degree up to until the end of the American Civil War, 1865 in the United States. And so so we're the ones that, that produce uh, cottonseed oil. And this was this had been used, it was previously a machine oil, and it was used lamp oil and then cattle feed. And then eventually they decided they'll just put it in food. And what they were yeah. doing was they started adulterating lard with it, and then they had adulterated uh, olive oil with it because they were able to sell this and they were sending it to Europe, for example. But it was anyway, cheaper it's, too, right? Oh, it's fantastically it. cheaper. Yeah. 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 Olive oil is expensive to make and the, all the seed oils. And let me qualify those. Let me characterize those better. So for all the listeners, um, the highly polyunsaturated seed oils, the ones that I would characterize as extremely dangerous would be um, soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, and rice bran. And if we go back to 1865, the world had never seen any of these essentially, except for really tiny amounts here and there. Very, very small populations had a, a few of these. But anyway, so like for the United States, all of Europe, 
Nobody had ever seen a polyunsaturated vegetable oil until we made it. We started consuming it in 1866. So I calculated the omega-6 consumption in our diet for 1865 based on a 40% animal fat diet because that's where everybody got all of their omega-6 would have come from pasture-raised beef, chicken, pork, and lamb. With the omega-6 that would have been in those types of animals, our consumption would have been about 2.2 grams of omega-6 per day, and that's less than 1% of our calories consumption. Wow. So that had effectively, because we began consuming seed oils by 1909, when Tanya Blasbo started analyzing that data, which we've also done, consumption of omega-6 was up to 4.84 grams a day. We're already at about 2% of our calories. So that increases with the begin to consume more and more and more of these seed oils, and those seed oils replace and supplant butter, lard, and beef tallow. By 1999, we're at 18 grams a day. This is of lin- omega-6 linoleic acid alone. That's the primary omega-6 mm-hmm. fatty acid. That's 7% of our calories by 1999. By 2008, we're at 29 grams of omega-6 linoleic acid alone. That's 11.8% of calories. And guess what? It's still rising. We're still replacing more and more animal fat with these seed oils. And so if you look at that, just that time frame between 1865 and 2008, that is approximately a 12-fold increase in omega-6 linoleic acid alone. And that is devastating. And the reason that it is devastating is because we're not meant to burn omega-3 and omega-6 fats for fuel. We're meant to use these as signaling molecules and as structural molecules, primarily in cellular membranes and in the mitochondria. And what happens is, is that our bodies latch onto these and we tend to store these. And so what we see is, is that the more of these you consume and you can increase your levels of these in your cellular membranes and in your fat, you know, your adipose tissue, you can store these very quick, but you cannot get rid of them for a long, long time. So let me just also mention that, so Stefan Guillenay did this research where he looked at the linoleic acid, the omega-6 linoleic acid in our body fat in the United States between 1959 and 2008. And in our body fat, on average in 1959, I believe the number was Mm -hmm. 9.1% of omega-6 in our fat. And so that steadily climbs with our increasing consumption of these seed oils. And by 2008, our body fat, on average, contained 21.5% seed oils, I think the number was. Uh, I'm sorry, 21.5% omega-6 fat, linoleic acid fat. From the seed oils, yeah, yeah. Yeah, from the seed oils. And this is what I presented at Low Carb Denver was. So here a few months ago, I found that in Tokelau uh, is a population where no seed oils were consumed. They did biopsies of 18 men from their buttocks uh, back in 1968. And their omega-6 linoleic acid in their fat was 3.8%. Mm. So this is the only study that I'm aware of ever done on any population or anyone consuming a native traditional diet, and they determined what their omega-6 was in their fat. It was the uh, total allowance, 3.8%. So compare that to our current, you know, well, when I say current, 2008, 21.5%, and it's probably in the high 20 some percent now because we're still consuming more and more of these and we're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Mm. Anyway, what I might do, you know, I could run through a little bit of our medical history, Brian, if you want me to. Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing you're talking about just all these American Heart Association, all these people who are recommending us eat these terrible oils and replace animal fats when it's just the other way around. Yeah, and and there's only one reason. This goes back, to, you know, to the cholesterol theory, the ridiculous uh, mm-hmm. uh, theory, of course, that we know now that cholesterol causes heart disease, and saturated fat raises cholesterol, and therefore saturated fat is the villain, right? And cholesterol yeah. is still considered the villain, and so this goes back to one thing 
and one thing only as it regards these polyunsaturated seed oils, and it is merely the fact that they do lower cholesterol, and they do it pretty well. And this is not a good thing. And yeah. So I've looked at, you know, if I could talk about heart disease real quick. Is that all right, Brian? Yeah. yeah. So here's what I discovered. If you look at heart disease, for example, over the last 200 years, um, what you see is, is that this disease tracks almost perfectly with our increasing consumption of vegetable oils. And remember that vegetable oils have, they have gradually supplanted lard, butter, and beef tallow. So let me throw out one more statistic while I'm here is yeah. on that subject is that, think about this. In 1900, when we were fantastically healthy population, 99% of the added fats in our diet came from lard, butter, and beef tallow. By 2005, 86% of our added fats came from vegetable oils. So they oh. almost have completely replaced and supplanted lard, butter, and beef tallow, and it's still climbing. All right, so heart disease. So 1811, so this is everything I'm going to tell you, by the way, this is all published. If I say anything at all, the only thing I probably will say today that isn't published is that 2.2 grams of omega-6 we consumed in 1865. That's a number that I've calculated, mm. and we're, that'll come out in our next paper. I'm working with a number of oh, ophthalmologists and nutrition researchers for our next paper. But that'll be in our next paper. But anyway, so in Boston, 1811, there was, there's records of all the causes of death, and there was no heart disease deaths listed. There was 25 sudden deaths, and that was 2.6% of the population. And probably most of those, as you're going to see, I'll tell you what will come next, but is that most of those were probably due to congestive heart failure due to cardiac valvular disease. Let me come back to that. So in the, in the entire 19th century, there was eight papers in the world regarding coronary artery disease, and there were only two cases, published cases of coronary thrombotic events, in other words, the equivalent of a myocardial infarction, two in the world. In mm. fact, in 1897, Sir William Osler, he was the famed physician, you know, he was one of the founding partners of Johns Hopkins Hospital, and he published a paper in 1897. And in this paper, Brian, he reviewed his previous 21 years of hospital experience, and he recalled a roughly about six cases of angina, you know, chest pain that might be cardiac related, but he had never seen a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And then 13 years later in 1910, he presented at a medical conference in London, England, and he recounted seeing between 1897 and 1910, 208 additional cases of angina. And he attributed that to, quote, high pressure of modern life, end quote. It was something like that. I'm paraphrasing, but that's yeah, almost yeah. the exact quote. So here's the thing. William Oster, one of the most, you know, he was knighted. He was one of the most famous physicians in all of history. Um, he recounted his history. So between 1876 and 1910, he saw about 214 cases of angina. He had never witnessed a heart attack ever. In fact, he published a book, a well-known book in 1893, uh, a medical textbook, Myocardial Infarction Heart Attack was not known. It was unknown. Okay. So by night, so anyway, so 19, um, 1912 was the first known heart attack in the United States, reported by John Herrick, a physician, and uh, he evaluated the autopsy connected the myocardial infarction to the, or the symptoms to the myocardial infarction, it was ignored. People didn't even take it seriously for about a decade, like until the 1920s, because they never heard of a heart attack. You know, they, yeah. this was virtually unknown. And, but interestingly, so that was 1912, but by the 1930s, heart disease was the leading cause of death in the United States. So you already have to say what in the world happened between, you know, the mid 19th century and 1930s, you know, why was this disease that was completely unknown in 1900 now the leading cause of, of death? So by um, 2010, today, essentially 32.3% of deaths are due to coronary artery disease. It's an explosion, you know, it's something like, I think it's around 78 million, 80 million people or so in the United States today have some form of cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Okay, so cancer, Boston, 1811, one in 188 people 
died of cancer in 1811. 1900, in the United States, it was one in 17. It's already increasing. 2010 today, it's like 31.1%, I believe is the number. So again, it's almost one in three. Wow. So we went from one in 188 in 1811 to almost one in three by 2010. So a period of 200 years. It's not just because of aging. We could talk about that too. All right. Type 2 diabetes, you know, which kind of parallels obesity. And I'll mention that real quick too. But type 2 diabetes was virtually unknown in almost all of history. Um, it was definitely, most definitely, exceedingly rare in the 19th century. By 1935, it was elevating. It was at 0.37%. So this just continues to increase. Like by uh, 1960, it was up to 0.91%, which is a two and a half fold increase. By 2015 in the U.S., it's 9.4%, which is a 25-fold increase in a period of 80 years. So 25-fold in 80 years. All right. Obesity. Uh, 19th century. So there was this researcher that looked at all these studies of men in prisons in Texas and Nebraska. And these were men that were 18 to 80 years of age, and they recorded their height and weight so he could calculate their BMI. Well, the BMI shows that in the 19th century, obesity in men age 18 to 80 in Nebraska and Texas was 1.2%. So by 1960, we know that in the United States, obesity was 13%. That's when we, everybody thinks we were really lean, right? Between 1900 and 1960, obesity had gone up 11-fold already, right? And so this just continues to climb. It's at uh, 23% by 1988. It's at 39.8% obesity in 2015. And we're on target to be at 50% of all Americans obese by 2030. But already, you know, between the late 1800s and 2015, that is a 33-fold increase in obesity. We went from 1.2% to 39.8%. And um, the similar number, it's kind of similar in youth, you know, I was, obesity was under 5% in 1963, it was 18.4% for kids age 6 to 11 by 2016, 20.6% for kids 12 to 19 in 2016. Uh, and then uh, I'll just mention macular degeneration was an extraordinarily rare disorder between 1851, when it was first discoverable, to 1930. And by the 1970s, about four and a half million people with macular degeneration. Today in the world, 196 million people with macular degeneration, but no more than 50 cases of macular degeneration in all the world's literature between 1851 and 1930. And, and that they, then they were looking, they were examining, they incredible detail about the retina in that entire era. Uh, because they were using ophthalmoscopes. But mm. so what happened was, is, you know, uh, between 1822 and 1999, sugar consumption went up 17 fold. You know, we talked about vegetable oil consumption introduced in, in 1866. And now, as of 2010, occupies 32 and a half percent of American consumption. I mean, it's almost a third of our diet is vegetable oils. And then, you know, we got refined white wheat flour in 1880 because of roller mill technology. That's a, so this is a nutrient deficient food and wheat is 20% of the world's diet. And in the United States, 85.3% of that is refined white wheat flour. So it's a nutrient deficient food. So you put those together and throw in the trans fats. And by 2009, somewhere between 63 and about 74% of the American diet is made up of nutrient deficient foods. And again, we could start talking about toxicity related to seed oils, really. But that's kind of the big picture. Yeah, no, it's great. And it's visually, it's a lot easier to see all these numbers and stuff. And you have a couple of presentations online and the low carb Denver one will come online at some point in the next couple months. So yeah, I encourage right, anyone to right. check those out and see all this stuff visually. But yeah, let's go on to toxicity. It's a lot more difficult really to lay this out, you know, without a lot of um, pictures and so forth. But vegetable oils, first of all, we've got multiple, we've got essentially four major problems with vegetable oils. Number one is, is they're nutrient deficient. So if you look at all the oils, they're almost all nutrient deficient. Even the healthy ones like coconut palm, palm kernel, 
avocado and olive oil as compared to butter, for example. So like grass-fed butter, you're getting vitamins A, D, and K2. And those are fundamental and critical to our health, whereas you won't get those in any oils. You'll get some vitamin E in the vegetable oils and nothing else as far as nutrients goes. Then you have the issues with the vegetable oils that they are pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidative, and toxic. These are really huge topics. So if you just look at the pathways of pro-inflammatory, what you see is as you go down the pathway of, you know, omega-6 metabolism, you know, the end result of that is you're getting pro-inflammatory prostaglandins, eicosanoids, and thromboxanes. And so these things are driving inflammation. They're driving strokes because of the thromboxanes. They're probably playing a huge role in almost every inflammatory disease that you, know, that you can think of, essentially. Whereas, on the other hand, the omega-3 PUFAs would primarily come from alpha-linolenic acid. But anyway, so from there, you get favorable prostaglandins, anti-inflammatory molecules like resolvins, protectins, maricins, and you get a form of leukotrienes that are much less inflammatory than the leukotrienes you would get with omega-6. So the omega-3, essentially, they're mostly inflammation-resolving, anti-thrombogenic, and anti-arrhythmic, again, all counter to the uh, omega-6 PUFAs. Yeah. Pro-oxidative. This is a topic that is extremely hard to just talk about without pictures, Brian, uh -huh. and, and seeing pathways. But let me just explain this. That So what I have come to understand over the past number of years, when I heard that a molecule or a product was pro-oxidative, it just didn't mean that much to me. And I couldn't differentiate it so much from inflammation. The molecules that come out of oxidation are really things like superoxide, hydroxyl radicals, hydrogen peroxides, singlet oxygen, and then lipid peroxides. And the interesting thing about this is that, is that now we make a huge number of these pro-oxidative molecules every day just naturally, and it's, it's normal to a degree. But what I've discovered over the last couple of years is that when you consume a high linoleic acid diet, in other words, a high omega-6 diet, what happens is, is that you accumulate these omega-6s in your body, like we talked about, maybe 3.8%, like the TOC allowance, but we're at at least 21.5% in our body. And these are filling up our cell membranes and our mitochondrial membranes with this linoleic acid. Well, the thing about the omega-6s is that they are polyunsaturated. And polyunsaturated fats, unlike saturated and monounsaturated fats, they're extremely prone to oxidation or what the lipid chemist would call peroxidation. So they have those double bonds and because of that, they oxidize. And when they oxidize, one of the major things that happens is, is that, so we need to have linoleic acid, omega-6, in our diet. And one of the reasons we do is because that linoleic acid plays a, an extremely important role in a molecule called cardiolipin, which is a phospholipid upon which our inner mitochondrial membrane depends to create energy. And the reason it does is because this cardiolipin helps to maintain the integrity of the inner mitochondrial membrane where electron transport chain works. Well, let me tell you this. Electron transport chain is where 90% of our energy is made. And the way it works is, is that this inner mitochondrial membrane, in our mitochondria, there's a process where there are protons pumped into this membrane space, hydrogen protons. And that proton gradient is used, the electrochemical force that it has is used by way of passing the hydrogen protons back through the membrane. In that same mechanism, it phosphorylates ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's how we make energy. And mm -hmm. what happens is, is that that cardiolipin that helps maintain that membrane, it breaks down and those hydrogens leak through the membrane and you lose your proton gradient. 
Well, that proton gradient is the whole reason that we can make energy, make ATP. But here's what gets even more interesting is that, so not only do we lose energy when we're, so when we consume a high linoleic acid diet, that linoleic acid in the proteolipin breaks down, the proton gradient is lost, and now what happens is, is these electrons are transferred along the electron transport chain, and they leak out of the membrane, just like the protons, and they create oxidized particles. So in the form of hydroxyl radicals, well, initially superoxide, and then hydroxyl radicals and so forth. And all of the, the very first thing that happens out of this is, again, we have energy failure, and then we have insulin resistance at the cellular level. You know, people always talk about insulin resistance, you know, it's a driver of obesity, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes. Well, here's what happens is, is omega-6 fats drive insulin resistance by breaking down the electron transport chain of the mitochondria. And that's the first thing that happens at the cellular level. You get insulin resistance. And because the cell is sick, Brian, the cell is sick from the seed oils. The Krebs cycle and electron transport chain where we're making almost all of our energy is broken down. And so the cell becomes insulin resistant. It's a way of saying, look, don't give me any more food. I don't want any glucose. I don't want any fatty acids. I don't want anything because I'm sick here. I can't function right. That's where insulin resistance is coming from. It's happening primarily because of omega-6 fats. The only other thing that can drive that in that sort of a way is fructose, sugar, because fructose, which is half of sucrose. So sucrose or table sugar is glucose and fructose. Mm -hmm. So the fructose component can drive uh, oxidation because when fructosylates, means it combines with proteins, you get a free radical. So it's kind of like what's happening in this electron transport chain. So now you have insulin resistance. And what's happening is, is that Everything from here, the whole cell just begins to kind of fall apart because when you have um, failure of energy, you know, one of the very next things that happens is, is, well, the cell is unable to process fatty acids properly. And so now you're glycolysis dependent, meaning you're needing to process carbs for fuel because you can't process fats for fuel very well. So what happens is, is the cell just begins to store lipids. And so now we're in a storage mode. So your energy is going down. You know, you want to consume carbs because you feel better because your glycolysis is still working. But now your cell is storing fat in a very efficient way. Mm. And again, this all comes from, you know, from seed oils. Do you think it's the necessity of insulin resistance to have these seed oils that people couldn't get insulin resistance without them as in if someone overate consistently for years you know whole foods diet or i guess processed but without these omega-6s could they get insulin resistance i think you can um but i think the only other way that i know that you can do this i'm not saying that i know for sure here brian but mm -hmm. the only other way that i'm aware of would be to have a really high sugar diet like 50 percent sugar or 25% fructose, because you don't seem to get the toxicity of fructose until you're around 25% of your mm. diet. And that is huge. You know, that is a yeah. huge amount. But that's possible in modern diets, if you're drinking yeah. sodas and doing all that. <laughs> it's pretty close, yeah. You know, especially youngsters that are consuming that, uh, you know, that kind of level of sugar. So, but they're also, the same people consuming that much sugar are consuming a whole lot of the vegetable oils because they go hand in hand. Yeah. So the thing about all of these disorders is, is when you look at the mitochondria, Brian, in all of these disorders, obesity, hypertension, atherosclerosis, congestive heart failure, Alzheimer's, macular degeneration, type 2 diabetes, and more, all of these have one thing in common, and it's mitochondrial dysfunction. And the mm -hmm. reason they do is because of this mechanism. When you have energy failure, at the mitochondria, one of the very next things that happens is, is there's no energy to properly reproduce DNA. So you get DNA mutations in the nucleus and mitochondria. And this is why we see over 10,000 different kinds of mutations in cancer cells, right? Because they're willy-nilly, they're random. They're not mm -hmm. targeted. It's just that the cell is essentially, you know, everything is dysregulated. 
this mitochondrial dysfunction leads directly to apoptosis or necrosis, which is two different methods of cell death. And that, you know, that's causing diseases like macular degeneration, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. The mitochondrial dysfunction is proven in three weeks of a high PUFA diet, <clears throat> I think it was three weeks or four weeks, causes heart failure in rats. Mm. So just a safflower oil diet at 19% of energy, which I think is almost exactly the same as what Americans are consuming, causes congestive heart failure in rats. It's either three or four weeks. I can't remember the exact number. So anyway, so there's the mechanism. I mean, for virtually all of the diseases of civilization is essentially this. This is the big picture. But it, and I know that gets really complicated, you know, trying to explain that without pictures. Uh, yeah, no, thanks for taking us through that. And some people would probably understand all that. And some people, they don't care at all. But at least you <laughs> know what you're talking about. So it's good. And this kind of makes sense in this general high level sense, too, because I always like to talk about all these different diets that work and they're very different, but they have these common themes. So this kind of makes sense of things as people are like, oh, well, you know, carbs are bad. Carbs are evil. It's like, not really the carbs. It's the refined carbs and the vegetable oils that come along with it. And that all these populations that we can get into too. You talk about some of this more epidemiological stuff or observational stuff or of populations around the world. These people aren't eating the omega-6s. That's a commonality, right? That you can have high-carb diets. You can have low-carb diets. You can have all different types of diets, high-saturated fat, low-saturated fat. But really, no one's no healthy population is eating the omega-6s. That is exactly right. So we can go into those two. Let me mention real quick. So I talked about, you know, so we've talked about pro-inflammatory with seed mm -hmm. oils, pro-inflammatory, they're pro-oxidative. That's the really complicated part, the pro-oxidative and really hard to do in a podcast. Okay. Toxicity. This is a thing, Brian, I find that my fellow physician colleagues, I don't care what profession they're from, they have such a hard time accepting the term toxicity when it comes to our food supply. And honestly, I have to admit, I was exactly the same way when somebody would say, uh, you're consuming a toxic diet. I'm like, oh, right, right. Yeah, no, that's, no, I know. You mean. <laughs> Just yeah, yeah, no. The problem is there's a lot of bogus stuff out there. Like they have, I don't know, I've seen these like foot pads and you like step on them and it's and they turn black and it's like, oh, the toxins are leaving your body. I mean, <laughs> see, there I are some that. like really bogus things out there. So it gives it a bad name. <laughs> that is bogus. Yeah, well, uh, sounds bogus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me just so I've hit it and we won't, you know, won't go into detail here, but just so I've hit it, here's the toxicity is and with this, we can, if you want to call these poisons, I'm a hundred percent with you, but here's what happens when you consume omega-6 polyunsaturated fats from all of those seed oils, vegetable oils, whatever you want to call them. The very first thing that happens is, is they peroxidize. All right. They're either oxidized in the bottle or they oxidize within your body. Take your pick or both. And the first thing that they're converted into or is... Or in the fryer. Or in the fryer, yes, exactly, which makes it even worse. Yeah. yeah, They're just devastating when you heat them because here's what happens is, is so they're converted first into what are called lipid hydroperoxides. And this is where you add a hydroxyl radical onto the linoleic acid, essentially. And then what happens is, is these just rapidly break down into a whole bunch of different toxins, all right? These are things like 4-hydroxynonanol or 4-HNE, malondialdehyde, MDA, the oxidized linoleic acid metabolites, which are things like 9 and 13 HODE. And HODE is, actually stands for hydroxyoctadecadienoic acid. I'll never say that again, Brian. That's the only time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 9 and 13 HODE, and then also acrolene and carboxyethylpyrrole. And then there's others. There's alkanes, there's alkenes, there's... Uh, dienes. There's a number of these aldehydic or aldehyde products that come from omega-6 fats, and these things are devastatingly toxic to us. So just collectively, uh, all these together are cytotoxic, genotoxic, mutagenic, carcinogenic, atherogenic, thrombogenic, and obesogenic. Mm. And for those who don't know, atherogenic means atherosclerosis inducing and thrombogenic means clot inducing so these chemicals that come only from omega-6 polyunsaturated fat seed oils 
are all this dangerous. They're extraordinarily dangerous and linked to all kinds of disease. Almost these things are part of every disease of civilization there is. I don't care if it's it's atherosclerosis, it's macular degeneration, it's obesity. Yeah. I'm telling you, they are huge. This is a huge part of it, and that's the toxic part. And I can delve into that deeper, but that's just a quick overview. That's great. I want to do a little obvious, Captain Obvious recap here. Sure. We've been eating animal foods for all of history, and we were healthy. Then we started making these insane, highly processed oils that were like factory oils, industrial seed oils we used in machines. And we started feeding them to humans. We started doing these 12-step processes with deodorizations and chemicals and whatnot to get this, the oil out of the seeds. And then we have all these problems and we wonder why. We have these groups like the AHA and the, all the American Diabetes Associations and Heart so all these people saying that we should replace natural fats with these highly processed oils. It's too obvious. Hey, there's no other word for it except insane. It's just absolutely insane. It is absurd. There's only one thing that all of these these researchers, you know, from Harvard to Tufts to Mayo to the American Heart Association, they're all hanging their hat on one thing, and it's that seed oils drive your cholesterol down, and they do. And that doesn't help you at all. And that is another entire topic, but for people who don't know this, um, there is virtually no relationship whatsoever between total cholesterol or LDL and heart disease. This is proven you know, by coronary artery calcium scanning. 19 different mm -hmm. studies showed that. That was a paper that came out. I can't think of the author's name right offhand, but it was 19 different studies that looked at the the you know the gold standard for heart disease is coronary artery calcium scanning, which is done with a CT scan or uh, electron beam tomography, and there's no relationship. It doesn't matter if your cholesterol is 600 or 60; you're just as likely to have heart disease either one, mm -hmm. right? And it's because of the fact that there's one thing. Before I move on, so yeah, yeah. Malcolm Kendrick and his group, which I think was like 19 different physicians and researchers around the world, international group of uh, researchers, they published another study. It was like, again, I think it was around 19 studies with 30 different cohorts. They looked at LDL, cholesterol versus uh, heart disease and length of survival, essentially. And what they showed is that there is either no correlation or mostly in the huge majority of the studies, I think it was 86% or so, if I remember right, the higher your cholesterol, the longer you live, right? Yeah, I especially mean, as you age, it's more important. Right. And so the thing is, is yeah, but what we know, LDL is not connected to heart disease. Oxidized LDL is. And oxidized LDL comes from, and this is another entire podcast, is, is oxidized LDL comes from seed oils. And we know there's a whole uh, slew of evidence that increasing linoleic acid in your diet, seed oils in your diet, drives oxidation of LDL. It's, I mean, this, there is so much evidence in this regard. Uh, whereas monounsaturated fats like olive oil, uh, oleic acid, and saturated fats do not. They don't oxidize LDL. So that is the huge connection. But if you want to know your your heart disease risk, you know, you want to get a CAC scan, a coronary artery calcium scan. They're as little as in Denver, they do them for $99. I had my own done here just a few weeks ago for the first time mm. and luckily had a zero score. Yeah. And uh, I eat huge amounts of saturated fat, but this is why, you know, because it's not, it's not driven by saturated fats, driven by seed oil. I just thought of this that's kind of obvious as well is people are obsessed with olive oil and Mediterranean diet and stuff and they think it's magic when really it's just replacing the bad oils. There's people who eat a lot of these oils instead of bad oils. So of course they're healthy. Yeah, I don't have a problem with good, healthy, real, authentic olive oil, but I'm sure you know, Brian, that in the United States, 80% of the olive oil, the so-called olive oil is adulterated with these cheap, um, polyunsaturated oils like canola, soybean. Yeah, no, it, it's hard to figure it out. I've tried to look at the bottles and they're all like, oh, they don't explicitly tell you that it's definitely blended and it's definitely not <laughs> all real olive oil, but it's very hidden. 
Oh, yeah. And I don't put it past. There's a whole lot of companies out there that have no uh, no ethics or scruples at all. They're just adulterating their so-called olive oil with these oils and they just put on their olive oil, you know, whatever. And people think they're consuming something good. And guess what they're getting is polyunsaturated oils. And so it's the worst possible thing you can do to yourself, you know, short of carbon monoxide or um, <laughs> some other <laughs> poison, you know. And also, if you're getting a Costco tub of it for twelve ninety nine, it's you got to be realistic and realize it's not real olive oil. So it's like, yeah, if you got it over in Italy and it was twenty five dollars for a, a pretty small bottle comparatively, then you know maybe you're good. But or just stick to animal fats. <laughs> yeah. So you know we, and I don't think I mentioned this number, but as of two thousand ten, Americans consume eighty grams of vegetable oils. Of this is the bad oils, the the ones I mentioned, the high PUFA oils. Eighty grams per day per American. That's men, women, and children. 80 grams a day. That's 720 calories worth. So I did the math on this because I looked up soybean oil is, I think, the most, um, the number one oil in terms of volume in the world, I believe. And I'm not dead sure, but it is one of the huge ones. And, and worldwide in 2014 and 15, the cost of soybean oil was, I think, right at around 74 cents per kilo. So a kilo is a thousand grams. So if we do the math, so 74 cents for a thousand grams, that's 9,000 calories worth of food. And I use the term loosely. Um, So I did the math. So 80 grams a day, you know what it costs for these big food companies to buy 80 grams worth of soybean oil? 5.6 cents, I think it was. It's less than six cents to give you 720 calories, essentially a third of your diet for 5.6 cents. Oh my God. Yeah, that is exactly why they adulterate olive oil because you can't make olive oil inexpensively. It's expensive. So if you're buying, just like you said, you're buying half gallon of uh, so-called olive oil or whatever it is, you know, at Costco for $12, you know, don't be fooled. It's probably mostly adulterated. Absolutely. And I want to bring it back. I did a graphic on Instagram a long time ago about the food industry explain. And it's so obvious, just more than just diluting olive oil is just every product out there that's packaged and processed, just stuff in the cheapest ingredients, these oils and flours and sugar, and you can make money. That's it. Yeah. So for just a a couple of cents worth of vegetable oil, maybe a cent or two worth of refined wheat flour, and for maybe two cents worth of sugar, you can make a three or four dollar package worth of Pop Tarts, right? And I remember a long time ago, but you know, maybe back in 2011, I heard Lauren Cordain say, he said something like, I'll paraphrase here, but he said, you know, call it a cookie, call it a Pop Tart, or call it a pizza, but it's made of these foods. That resonated with me. It hit home. And I started thinking. So and that's the thing is, is, you know, there's 500 and some thousand foods that big food manufactures out of those four ingredients, sugar, refined flour, you know, vegetable oils, and trans fats. You just put them together and some mystery ingredients and make it taste good with the sugar. And there you go. And it's, you can sell it for, you know, you can make it for a few cents and sell it for a few dollars. I, this needs to be a graphic in the film. I'm just thinking about this, some way to show this, like every single food, yeah, line up all these foods and they're all the same thing, really. They're just like slightly different combinations with different little flavor additives, but they're all the same. That, it's exactly right. They're all the yeah. same. Okay, let's finish up with the other populations around the world eating their different diets so you can kind of yeah, recap some of those it. populations. Yeah, okay. So the Maasai warriors, for those who don't know, they're a population, they're a tribe in Kenya and Tanzania. And they've been studied quite extensively back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even some more recently. But they're pastoralists. They raise cattle and they live almost exclusively off of the milk, meat, and blood from their cattle. In fact, they consume almost no fruits or vegetables at all. In fact, in the Miran cohort, well, I call them a cohort. That's not what they would call them. But in the Miran, which is the the warriors who are, I think they enter when they're about 14 years old, and they're in the Miran until they're 30 to 35, they are forbidden to consume anything other than milk, meat, and blood. 
George Mann's group back in 1972 published their extensive study, and it was just amazing. So the average Maasai consumed 3,000 calories a day. On average, they consume three to five quarts of raw whole milk per day. And that milk is really high in saturated fat. It's like up to 68% saturated fat. So that means that 66% of their diet was animal fat. And around 33 to 45% of that would be saturated animal fat. So at least 33% now is saturated animal fat. Now, you know, for those who are not aware, the American Heart Association tells us that we should not be consuming more than 5 to 6% of our calories as saturated fat. So the Maasai, but their omega-6, I calculated this, it's about 1.7% of their diet. That's their omega-6. Now remember, Americans are getting, we were at 7% by 1999. We're at about 12% by 2008, and it's higher than that today. But anyway, so the Maasai... 1972, they had 50 autopsies and they had 350 EKGs, not a single heart attack in the entire group with the exception of one possible silent heart attack in one man who was 50 years of age. So they virtually have no heart disease and anybody who's seen the Maasai, they are fantastically lean, chiseled, brilliant, healthy looking guys with perfectly straight, beautiful Oh, natural yeah. white teeth. They have no obesity, not even close. They don't have any, um, you know, diabetes, obesity, nothing like that. Fantastic. No, virtually no cancer. Yeah. I had to jump in. I did a little conference thing in Long Beach and I mentioned the Maasai and afterwards a guy from the audience came up and told me he was Maasai. And I immediately was like, wow, this guy was tall amazing teeth, amazing jaw shape, you know, wide, all this Weston Price stuff, the wide dental yeah. arches. This guy was amazing. Just like, he just looks so healthy and strong. And he actually said he went back to visit his home recently and they were a mess that the people who were eating the modern foods were getting sick. And, you know, it's exactly what we're talking about here. And actually I was supposed to go to Kenya and maybe Tanzania to visit with the Hadza. There's a woman over there who invited me to to tag along, but I don't know what's going to happen with this whole lockdown thing. And if I can get a flight or if I should even travel, obviously I shouldn't be traveling right now. So we'll see if that happens. Wow. That's interesting. You said Hadza, but did you mean Maasai? Oh, I meant Maasai. We yeah. also, she wants to take us to the Hadza as well and a few other tribes, but yes, Maasai. Sorry. Oh, that would just be brilliant, Brian. Keep me in the loop on that if you would. I, yeah. I Because eventually that's where, you know, I want to do the same I want to follow in Weston Price's footsteps. I am a huge Weston Price acolyte, as I know you are, but I want to follow in his footsteps and do the same kind of studies for macular degeneration. You mm, know, evaluate yeah. their, their people, you know, for macular degeneration because it's never been done. Yeah. There, there are no studies of macular degeneration in native traditional people anywhere. So the second population that I'll tell you about is the Tokelauans. So Tokelau is three little atolls, which are tiny little islands, essentially, down in the South Pacific. It's kind of about midway between Hawaii and Australia. Uh, the Tokelauans were studied extensively um, back in the 1960s and 70s, and even the 80s. Um, they're interesting because their traditional diet was uh, based largely on coconut, mm -hmm. um, but it was coconut fish, starchy tubers, and fruit. And they get about 54 to 62% of their calories just from coconut. Well, coconut is 91 to 94.5% saturated fat. Well, anyway, their diet was 53% fat and about 48% of their whole diet is saturated fat. In other words, their diet is virtually about half saturated fat, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, yeah. okay, now here's the cool part. 2% of it is PUFA. That's total PUFA. That's omega-3 and omega-6 together. So I think their omega-6 is under 1%. Again, compare that to westernized populations, which are at least 7 to 12% uh, omega-6 PUFA, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so 1982, they evaluated, and I don't remember the numbers, but it was men age 40 to 69, 0.0% had any evidence of heart disease with their 48% saturated fat diet, right? They had no obesity, no diabetes, 
extraordinarily healthy. And again, this is the population I was telling you about earlier that they also did their uh, biopsy, their their fat, and it was 3.8% omega-6. Again, compared to our, we were 9.1% in 1959 and 21.5% omega-6 in our fat by 2008, and I guarantee you it's higher today. So while the Maasai have the highest saturated animal fat of any population known in the world at up to 45% and have no heart disease, the Tokelauans have the highest saturated fat, which again is a tropical oil saturated fat, but it's at 48%, and they also had zero heart disease, right? So, you know, you just have to look at that and you go, well, how in the world does anybody indict saturated fat? Makes no sense at all, right? No sense. <laughs> Not at all. So then, you know, just for the counter argument that I presented at Low Carb Denver, because I'm not really a low carb guy, and I want to preface this just by saying low carb is fine. Low fat is fine. I don't care what you do with your macronutrients, in my opinion. Low carb, I would say overall, and I'll try to come back to this, Brian, but I'm going to say I do think low carb is easier to you know, for people to lose weight, but I have mm-hmm. my wreath. I'll come back to that. So, yeah, yeah. so, okay. So one, this one last population, Tukacenta, Papua New Guinea, also was studied in the 1960s extensively for a couple of years. And so the interesting thing about the, these Papua New Guineans is that of Tukacenta, they consumed more than 90% of their calories from sweet potatoes. That's almost all they eat. They just would have huge harvests of sweet potatoes. And then they would occasionally feast on pork and chicken. They're not vegans because of the occasional feast of animal meat. In fact, they are pig herders, but they would seldom, kind of like the Maasai, they would seldom kill their own their animals uh, for their own feasts. But anyway, so their diet is 94.6% carb because they would consume a few other uh, vegetables and fruits. Anyway, so they're ninety four point six percent carb. It was three percent protein, two point four percent fat, which is just astoundingly low fat. Mm-hmm. But anyway, if you calculate it, the omega six in their diet is about zero point six percent. In these studies, I'm going to read this. So this is what they said in the studies by Sinnott and White in the Journal of Chronic Disease, nineteen seventy three. Here's four quotes: Population was lean physically fit and in good nutritional state, absence of obesity and hypertension, no diabetes or gout was found, ischemic heart disease was rare, if not absent, end quote. And then, I didn't know this when I published my book in 2016, but this population, they had 340 people over age 40 that they studied for, they examined their retinas, not a single case of macular degeneration. So here's a population, you know, that is consuming a huge amount of carbs. And, you know, if you buy into the theory that carbs drive insulin and insulin drives fat, then what do you do with this kind of scenario? You know, um, it doesn't add up, right? And and it's it's kind of a similar scenario with the Catavans. And they're quite similar, but their diet was 69% carb because they consumed a lot of uh, uh, root vegetables and fish and coconut and some coconut, but they were 69% carb, 21% fat and 10% protein. And they also had no heart disease. So, yeah. but they're, they're a uh, South Pacific Island. Again, none of these have any consume any processed foods and they certainly don't have any vegetable oils. Exactly. I brought up the Kitavans and the Simone. I know, I think you probably mentioned those people mm-hmm. too, or even the Okinawans, you know, the more traditional Okinawans eating high sweet potato diet. Yeah, It's all yeah. whole foods. It's no omega-6s, seed oils. And so, yeah, I mean, I've talked about this from day one, even though I'm a fan of low carb diets, it doesn't I mean I don't understand <laughs> how that it can work and be completely fine in whole food sources without the omega sixes. Yeah, yeah. I just think if you want to eat most of your diet as sweet potatoes and you eliminate those processed foods, if you're not consuming sugars, refined wheat, vegetable oils, and trans fat, you're gonna be fine. You know, assuming your diet is made up of native traditional foods, which means that you couldn't eat, I don't believe, you know, 70% sweet potatoes and then make up the rest of your diet from CAFO raised beef and chicken because it's not going to be 
a traditional kind of fat. You're going to be getting higher PUFA just from those kind of animals. But if you consumed grass-fed, pasture-raised beef, chicken, and you only had, that was 10% of your diet, and the other 90% was sweet potatoes, you'll be fine. Well, absolutely. It just works. No, no, it's just people don't really do that. It's not like a common thing. If you're going to just talk about, and also people are metabolically damaged to begin with. So exactly. yeah, you, exactly. But still, I don't want to be defensive about the low carb diet. But like you said, it's easier to lose weight. It's easier to stick to. I think in our modern environment, it's easier to just give up carbs because the carbs, there's so many bad processed foods that involve carbs, right? It's almost like you're giving up carbs. You're kind of just giving up the worst offenders. And then you can embrace right. the good foods that with the fat and that people like anyway, and that are healthy for you and all these animal foods. So just practically, it works a lot better. Well, here's the thing, Brian, I am a low carb fan to a degree. And here's why, because I mean, I've seen, you know, there's something like 15 or 20 different studies that looked at this, and I think were good studies. And overall, people are losing more weight. So when people are needing to lose weight, they seem to do better on low carb. I think it's easier personally, if I need to get leaner to go low carb, I find it easier to do that. But as you already mentioned, what I believe is that the main reason that low carb works so well is because of this. I showed a a slide that came from our own, it came from the in Haynes study, a recent in Haynes, I think it was 2005 or six. Anyway, but it was the N. Haynes study, and they showed the top 15 sources of linoleic acid, omega 6 linoleic acid, in the diet. And I highlighted all the ones of those 15 that were also high carb. And guess what? It's 10 of them. And so here's my point you don't know, you don't have a clue what you're doing with your diet, right? And you just go, okay, I'm going to go low carb. I'm going to eliminate carbs. The first thing you do is you eliminate all the things like wheat, bread, potatoes, all the things that are usually go hand in hand with seed oils. Yeah. So you're reducing your seed oils. That's the biggest player right there. And second thing is, is that when you are metabolically challenged, metabolically sick already, which most Americans are, most of them are already insulin resistant, you know, two thirds to, you know, we know that 88% of Americans are not completely metabolically healthy, you know, right? So the first thing, I think the fastest way to get there, honestly, I believe is to go low carb and get rid of your seed oils. I think it's the fastest, easiest way to start getting healthier because, and here's the third premise I would maintain is that when you go low carb, so the carbs like let's just say bread, potatoes, uh, rice, pasta, pasta, those kind of things, those don't have a lot of nutrients. And so when you eliminate those and you start consuming other things that are mostly coming from animals, for example, because you're trying to consume a high fat diet, uh, if you go that route, then you're automatically going to be consuming more nutrients. You know, you're going to be getting more fat soluble vitamins and you're going to be getting more minerals. So that's, again, it goes back to now you're increasing your nutrient density and you're decreasing your toxicity in the diet. Yeah, that's how you started. Those are the two things. Right. It all comes back to that. You're fixing those problems and that's how you get healthier. Yeah. I drew a whole diagram of this two years ago and it, and those are the two things it was all based on too <laughs> that I was looking at. And it always comes back to that and Weston Price. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm a slow learner. I just am one of the, you know, you see how boring my life is because I spend my life, you know, digging, (laughs) you know, thousands of studies and eventually start clicking. And, you know, it's like playing an instrument, you know, if you just do it all the time, you get good at it. Yeah. We should move on to AMD. I don't think people really even know what macular degeneration is. I know we don't have much time and we covered a lot already. Yeah. Maybe we tease it. We give a high level view because it's almost... Related. Well, it's, it, it draws a lot of parallels to all these other diseases, right? It's like, even if you don't have this AMD, doesn't mm-hmm. mean this is pointless to listen to. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I, I'll do this very quickly, Brian. For those who are not aware, I am an ophthalmologist. Uh, I am a physician and surgeon and um, practiced for about 24 years. One of the things that 
ophthalmologists deal with all the time in westernized nations is, is age-related macular degeneration, or AMD. It is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss and blindness in people over the age of 65 worldwide and probably people over the age of 50. It is the l- third leading cause of blindness in the world, second behind cataracts and glaucoma. So this disease was discoverable in 1851 because of the genius of a physician and physicist by the name of Hermann von Helmholtz, who designed the ophthalmoscope, which allowed ophthalmologists to start looking into the back of the eye. So he published this design, Brian, in 1851, and this technology spread around the world within a decade. So the ophthalmoscope was being used on every continent by 1860. So, But interestingly, it was 24 years before the first cases of macular degeneration were described by an ophthalmologist by the name of uh, Jonathan Hutchinson in London, England in 1874. He described what looks like four cases. There's almost silence on the subject for the rest of the 19th century, with the exception of a couple of very quick statements. But one, there was one study by an ophthalmologist from uh, Germany or Austria. I can't remember which one right offhand, but his name is Otto Haab, H-A-A-B. And he evaluated 50,000 ophthalmic patient medical records in, in 1895 and confirmed that macular degeneration was as rare as traumatic maculopathy and myopic maculopathy. Well, these are things that I've seen like several in 24 years of ophthalmology. That's how rare they are, just extraordinarily rare. Mm-hmm. I'll give you one example. 1927, uh, moving, you know, moving ahead, Sir Stuart Duke Elder, one of the most famous ophthalmologists in all of history, published his first textbook of ophthalmology in 1927. Not a single word about macular degeneration in the entire textbook, right? Because that was par for the course through that entire era. Mm-hmm. Like they reviewed retinal conditions in fabulous detail, but macular degeneration just essentially almost did not exist. It was so exceedingly rare that that's how it was. 1975, four and a half million Americans have macular degeneration. Today, in the United States, about 26 million people with age-related macular degeneration. In the world, 196 million people with macular degeneration. And in the world, as of 2006, 3.15 million people, according to the World Health Organization, are blind in both eyes from macular degeneration. Sorry, just make sure yeah. people know what exactly it is. Yeah, okay, so the, the macula is the central retina. It's the, it's the part of your retina where, you know, when you look at, um, it, it accounts for your central 10 degrees of vision. And so when you look at a, like, when you're reading the words on a page, your macula sees the words. When you look at a stop sign or somebody's face, or look at, I don't know, the moon, or just, it, it's always what you're looking at, the central part of your vision yeah. lands on your macula. So when the macula degenerates, your vision starts to go awry. Um, so this doesn't happen all at once. It is a gradual process. A lot of people actually don't have any symptoms until their disease is pretty far along. And then their vision's getting blurry. You know, if they're not seeing an ophthalmologist or optometrist, their vision starts getting blurry and they come in and they may have very advanced macular degeneration. How does it relate to diet? Though? That's probably the most sort of controversial or a normal person listening. They're like, okay, but what does that have to do with diet and lifestyle? Right. So it, it is exactly like what we've been talking about. So I headed a small group that we looked at this and we looked at macular degeneration prevalence in 25 nations as it related to the consumption of processed foods. What we found, for example, I'll give you some examples. So like in Japan, macular degeneration was exceedingly rare. In one study, 1974 to 1979, macular degeneration prevalence for people over the age of about 45, I believe it was, was 0.2%. So 30 years later in 2007, macular degeneration prevalence in Japan at the lowest level uh, studied, so I'm using the most conservative numbers, was 11.4%. So that's a 57-fold increase in the prevalence of macular degeneration in a period of 30 years, 57-fold, 5,600% increase. Um, but what happened? Well, if you look at their processed food consumption, we use proxy markers of sugar and vegetable oil. Sugar didn't go up that much. It went up about one and a half fold 
but vegetable oils were nine grams a day in 1960. By 2005, I believe it was, they were at 39 grams a day. So vegetable oils went up four and a half fold in that roughly 45 year period. 39 grams a day is huge. What happened was all of the Asians, they have westernized their diets just like we did, only they've done it over the last five or six decades primarily. So a 57-fold increase in their macular degeneration prevalence in a period of 30 years. A very similar situation in uh, New Zealand. In the 1969, their macular degeneration prevalence was 1.3%. By 2009, I believe it was. I should get the numbers here, Brian. Let's see. Here we go. Just so I get the exact numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So it was actually 2014, their macular degeneration prevalence was 10.3%. So that was an increase in the prevalence of macular degeneration of eight fold or a 700% increase in a period of 40, about 45 years, right? But their vegetable oil consumption in 1960 was less than one gram a day. By 1991 and forward, their vegetable oil consumption was over 20 grams a day. So about a 20-fold increase in their vegetable oil consumption during that time. Mm. Now, I could talk about one more population, which is astounding if we have time. Yeah, we can go. I mean, if people are sticking around, they're sticking around. I'm here. Okay. I want to move to the mechanisms, too. Like, what is the mechanism of action in this? (laughs) Okay, (laughs) that is... (laughs) <laughs> that is fantastically deep. I can do the, you know, the the one the minute high level. overview. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me tell you about one population I sure. think is really, really interesting because conventional allopathic ophthalmology would tell you today that macular degeneration is driven by aging and genetics, Brian. That's this is the primary drivers, aging and genetics, right? Okay. And they would say there's a paper that came out in 2016 out of Bascom Palmer which is a huge training organization for ophthalmology in uh, Florida. But anyway, their finding was that genetics was driving 46 to 71% of macular degeneration. So Mm -hmm. up to 71% considered to be genetic. All right. So let's take that um, and run with this. Now, let me tell you about three populations that are all of West African heritage. All West Africans, if this is primarily genetic and aging, they all should have the same prevalence of macro degeneration, right? Mm. So there's a population in southwestern rural Nigeria. These are West Africans. Their macular degeneration prevalence was 0.1%. And this was recent. This was just a couple of decades ago, I think it was. About one out of 1,000 people with macular degeneration. Just 240 miles away in Onitsha, Nigeria, which is a metropolitan population, their macular degeneration prevalence was 3.2%. So it's 32-fold higher. How's that possible? Well, the people in southwestern rural Nigeria had no access to processed foods. They don't have any grocery stores. They have no restaurants. They're consuming a completely native traditional diet. Onitsha, Nigeria is a metropolitan population uh, with a population over 1.1 million people, and they've got restaurants, grocery stores, everything. Now, they don't have a diet nearly as bad as we do, which is why their macular degeneration prevalence is far less Mm -hmm. than... Americans, for example. All right. Now, if you go across the Atlantic down to Barbados, which I always think of as in the Caribbean, but it's really in the, it's really in the Atlantic, just across the, the line to close to the Caribbean. But anyway, if this is a 97, approximately 97% West African population because their heritage is West Africa. In the age group, 40 to 83 years of age, macular degeneration prevalence, 24.3%. Whoa. 243 fold greater than the West African people of southwestern rural Nigeria. That's 24,200% greater. Like you see these studies, right, Brian, where they go, well, this, you did this and you decreased your risk of heart disease by 20%. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is 24,200% greater. Why? Barbados is known to nutrition researchers all around the world as a mecca for processed food consumption because they import all of their food and imported food is processed food and they have very, very high sugar consumption. They have a high vegetable oil consumption. The numbers don't do it justice here. Yeah, but I've been there. Uh, I've been there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Most of the organizations that produce their vegetable oils or send them there, they're not reporting. And so we don't have the really good numbers. But the people of Barbados have 
a world profile of metabolic disease. So metabolic syndrome, obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, cancer, all that, right? They all go together. But this is the answer, you know? I mean, and the data they had like in the last, uh, since 1980 forward, their, the data we did have showed that their vegetable oil consumption, I believe, was greater than 20 grams a day. But it's probably severely undervalued there because of non-reporting. So those are some of the most compelling you know, population studies for macular degeneration. And as far as the mechanism, Brian, it's extraordinarily complex. Really, this is what almost half of my book is about, is what's going on at the molecular level in macular degeneration. And for people that are not ophthalmologists or optometrists, this would just rapidly become so complex, it would be almost meaningless. I will tell you this, extraordinary evidence that vitamins A, D, and K2 deficiency are all driving macular degeneration. And as far as the toxicity and how the vegetable oils are concerned, they are toxic to the retinal pigment epithelium. And the retinal pigment epithelium supports the photoreceptors, the rods and cones. And secondly, there are two other main things going on. One is, is that the choriocapillaris and the choroid, which is the vascular layer that supports the retina, you get occlusive vascular disease. So you get the equivalent of atherosclerosis, just like you do in the heart, right? Okay, so you're getting Mm -hmm. occlusive vascular disease. And then there's a layer called Brooks membrane, which sits between the choriocapillaris and the retina proper. And that Brooks membrane, it thickens and it calcifies and it behaves exactly like an atherosclerotic plaque. And I'm not the one that's making that, you know, I didn't make this up. This is coming from other researchers Mm -hmm. that see that Brooks membrane behaves as a, like an atherosclerotic plaque. So what's happening is, is you're getting choroid, you know, vascular disease, you're getting thickening of Brooks membrane, which creates a barrier. So now you have a barrier for gas exchange between the vascular layer and the retina, right? You got this barrier. And so now you have lack of nutrient and gas exchange between the two. The first thing that happens is the retinal pigment epithelial cells die. They become sick and or they die. And when they die, each one of those RPE or retinal pigment epithelial cells supports about 30 photoreceptors. Photoreceptors, again, are rods and cones. That's what sees. And so when they die, the rods and cones that they support die, and neither of those are regenerative. You can't get them back. They're like brain cells never coming back. Once they're gone, they're gone forever. So you need to prevent this disease and you prevent it by consuming a native traditional diet. And if you have the disease, you do the exact same thing. You consume a native traditional diet and you start fixing your problems. And we have, a, you know, now we have people three and four years into this that have stabilized their macular degeneration. Mm, that's yeah. great that they can, yeah, they can halt it. Is it kind of similar? I mean, this is a really layman's like high level view. That's something that I am probably going to get wrong. But even with with type 2 diabetes, people get their feet and limbs chopped off because of this disease. Is Mm -hmm. this kind of a little bit similar where just like super high level mechanisms, if your body has insulin resistance, like at the end of the limbs are these small blood vessels or these tiny little nerve, this damage occurs at the nutrients, the blood, the everything can't get to these places. Is it something like that? Absolutely. No, I think your analogy is brilliant. That's exactly what, you know, is going on. I mean, the researchers, Brian, from the 1930s and 40s, they began recognizing that one of the first things that you'd see histologically in the eye is, is that the choriocapillaris they were seeing occlusive disease, meaning just like what you're talking about, you know, in the limbs, when people get diabetic disease, what's happening is, is they're losing their capillaries first, and then eventually the bigger arteries, right? That's how they, you get necrosis and cell death, and then eventually tissue necrosis, and you end up having to lop off the, the mm-hmm. foot or the everything below the knee or whatever. It's the same thing. Yes, absolutely. And it's most all of that is driven by seed oils. Wow. Yeah. Shout out to my doctor friend, Dr. Chops. Dr. Chuck has to chop people's feet off. So I have to see this on a daily basis. It's terrible, but this is how it happens. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's tragic and it is a travesty because it's preventable. So one of the things I like to say, Brian, is, is that today in the United States, 
1,770 people will die of heart disease. Mm -hmm. 1,600 people will die of cancer. And in the world, at least 340 people will go blind due to macular degeneration. And every last bit of that is preventable. Yeah. Every last bit of it. A hundred percent. It's just the diet and lifestyle. And I mean, that's what this whole podcast is about. And the film is about everything we do, all these low carb conferences. Yeah. That's it. We're just trying to let people know this. Like We're the people who kind of figured this out. And that's why everyone's so passionate about it. Because we're just like, hey, we can stop this. Like people wake up. Yeah. And the message is just fantastically simple. I'm not saying it's easy to implement because in our world today, you've got to be extremely cautious how you eat. And I think that the number one thing you can do is just prepare almost all of your own meals and do it, you know, with ancestral ingredients. You have to be extremely cautious about eating out or buying any kind of food that's already made because that's where all these, that's where the dangers all lurk is in that kind of food. So you have to be vigilant, but the overall, the big picture is it's just so simple. Yeah. The seed oils creep in even good restaurants. They're still using the seed oils to cook with. Even if you get like a grass fed steak, they're going to slather it in whatever oil they have on hand. Yeah. It's super important. And I mean, I have a grass fed meat company. We also have high omega three chicken and pork. So this is an interesting product. We give them a special diet because usually chicken and pork is pretty high omega six. So we give right. them a special high omega three diet. So they have a uh, very high omega-3 meat when you eat it. And then, yeah, the, all the grass-fed beef. So that's nosetail.org. I never bring this up. I'm a bad marketer. I don't like to market products or anything. But uh, uh-huh. yeah. that's my only business I have right now is how I'm staying alive is I hooked up with a farmer in Texas and we're selling this and ship it out. So yeah, get your good, Brilliant. Get your good meat, make it yourself. I love to make all my own food. And especially now in these times where everyone's, you know, shelter in place on lockdown here, just make your own food. Don't order from Postmates and DoorDash. They're doing all these sales and free delivery, all that type of thing. Don't do that. Just make your own food. Right. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned that that you're getting seed oils, even in finer restaurants. And it is so true. We were at, I don't give the name, but it was a very fine uh, Brazilian steakhouse. Mm-hmm. recently just a few weeks ago and they're not cheap to eat at and uh fabulous food well anyway so they bring these um, plantains to the table and i love plantains mm-hmm. cooked right cooked in butter but anyway so we ask so what are these cooked in like uh vegetable oil like well we won't be eating those you know <laughs> um, yeah. Right. But that's the way it is, because, again, they're just looking at how, you know, what the bottom line for the most part, you know, the seed oils are dirt cheap and butter is expensive. Well, and they don't know any better, too, because the right. organizations tell them it's the thing to do. So, right. Exactly. Well, all right. Well, we got to go here. This is awesome stuff. So many things to look at. I'd encourage everyone again to go check out his presentations. You can find them on YouTube. You spoke at the Ancestral Health Symposium. What's your book called? That's for AMD though. Yeah, the book is called Ancestral Dietary Strategy to Prevent and Treat Macular Degeneration. And our website, Brian, is cureamd.org. It's Cure AMD Foundation and it's at cureamd.org. And we are completely nonprofit. I accept no, no compensation from this organization or even from my book sales mm-hmm. i'm just in this be to help people because a lot of people have helped me and i'm just paying it forward and i just love doing this because we're changing lives by the thousands and uh anyway yeah awesome. so you can visit us there and get and or find some of my presentations online at youtube as well perfect well thank you so much i can't wait to share this episode and let you know when it's out are you on social media yourself or can anyone go to social no, media? no i'm to really find not it? i haven't really done that brian but um <laughs> no worries but. i'll spread the word for you so thank you so much i want to say thank you brian it's been an honor and a pleasure truly and uh i'd love to be on your podcast again or work with you however we can uh, to move these messages forward so anyway thank you so Absolutely. much I appreciate it. yeah 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 definitely i mean i think we connect like a, over a year ago and um let's do it again sometime and thank you thank you brian take care all right that's a wrap folks thanks again for supporting nose to tail 
for supporting the show on Patreon, and for going to sapien.org to check out everything else that's going on. Stay happy and healthy, and see you next week. Bye.